this is today's schedule. We've done our welcome, and now we're about to jump into Endra's impact in 2022. Um, there are four sections related to our four strategy items for 2022. We're going to start with a, a set of presenters on talent funnel, then storage and retrieval, then programmability and compute, and then critical network operations. We are now going to dive into our Endres Working Group 2022 impact presentations. Um, again, talent funnel is going to be first, so if you're in the talent funnel section, check Check your slides, definitely be keeping track of where you are and maybe come up towards this, but I'm gonna give a quick overview first on the PL Working Group. Cool, awesome. So welcome everyone to our 2022 impact for the Endres Working Group. Um, we're gonna give a number of lightning impact updates from people across our team. Um, but to start out, what is the PL Endres Working Group? We are one of the many groups in the Protocol Labs network working to drive breakthroughs in computing technology to push humanity forward. And we're working on this because we think that the internet is one of humanity's superpowers and that's setting up a strong and robust foundation for future breakthroughs in computing that extend and empower the internet need to happen on a really robust, resilient, and empowering uh, framework for people's information. And so a lot of the work we do around IPFS, Filecoin, LibP2P is around enabling those digital rights that we think we should embed directly into the technologies that we use and rely upon every single day. Um, so these are a couple of the projects that we work through. Um, obviously, IPFS is a place we spend a ton of time, LibP2P and Filecoin. But we also spend a lot of our time on things like IPLD, TestGround, DRAND, and on supporting the immense network across the PL network of amazing projects and, and new research breakthroughs that are happening there as well. Um, quick view into some top 2022 impact metrics. Um, we have now seen LibP2P be supporting over 300,000 IPFS nodes, um, five and a half consensus clients powering, I think it's 450 plus thousand validator nodes. 4.6 thousand Filecoin storage providers and 112 thousand Polkadot parachain nodes. We've also seen things like the IPFS, IPFS network grow immensely, um, now having over, you know, at various different times, 300 to 700 thousand nodes in the IPFS network, which is crazy, um, and seeing find time drop down to like 400 milliseconds, which is pretty amazing. We've also seen the IPFS gateway um, really increase its user, user adoption. It's over 8x in the past year from, you know, it's like whatever, 4x, 4, 4 million at the beginning of the year, now over uh, 12 million today. Um, so just an amazing uh, increase in the number of users um, and in the number of requests that are being made every single week. Um, we've also seen networks like Filecoin grow immensely as well, um, 70, or, sorry, 37 percent growth in 2022, with North America growing almost 90 percent, which is fantastic. Um, and so this is the, the overall capacity being uh, made available on the Filecoin network. But what's really seen a breakthrough is scaling data onboarding, which is useful data being stored on Filecoin, um, vast majority through the Filecoin Plus program. We now have over 260 petabytes of live data and 10 million active deals, which is so cool. Um, that is really thanks to all of the hard work of people here, um, improving the core technologies that people are using um, and, and the programs and systems that help support them get things like Filecoin Plus data cap, things like that. Um, so we have still. 16 exabytes of data of capacity left to fill with useful data. So let's uh, let's get a move on it. We have a, you know, I'm sure that's only going to take us a, a couple more years, um, but really, really amazing progress and an amazing acceleration. You can see, you know, this is where we were in January, and the vast majority of of the total data being stored on Filecoin has happened um, just since January, which is really, really cool. Um, also, from a network perspective, uh, the, the work that we're doing has also permeated into many, many other teams and startups that are building upon um, kind of these core foundations and extending them and bringing them to users um, via, via products and businesses um, being built on things like Filecoin, IPFS, and, and similar tools. So now it's you know, over 500 companies, projects, um, and dev grants in this ecosystem, which is pretty amazing. Um, as a reminder, our Endres Working Group mission is to scale, unlock, scale and unlock new opportunities for IPFS, Filecoin, LibP2P, and the related PL stack of protocols, so some of the ones I mentioned before. Um, and we do this by onboarding amazing humans, all of the people in this room, but also um, supporting all of the amazing open source contributors um, and groups across the PL network that are trying to upgrade these technologies and working with them um, really seamlessly. 
Uh, we also do a lot of core work within the PL network on driving breakthroughs in protocol utility and capability. So this is adding new awesome things like Filecoin virtual machine or retrieval markets or interplanetary uh, consensus, things like that, um, to these networks to help, help make them better for everyone. Um, and then we also support these groups by doing network native research and development. So that's doing our work in the open, it's publishing our research so that many others can build upon it, um, and it's acting in a really collaborative and open way with the whole network of um, other teams and startups and projects growing in these ecosystems. This was our strategy for 2022. We're still, still working on it, it's still only October. Um, but we kind of had four critical sections. Um, first was talent funnel. This is focused on um, one, operating in a network native way where we're really embedding our knowledge and um, capabilities into every team across the network, externalizing that, that research knowledge, growing our team. We can definitely check that one off. We've, <laughs> we've definitely uh, grown a ton this past year, but also helping support many other teams in their growth over, the, over that period of time. And so helping teams like Outer Core, helping other new teams get started across the PL network, things like Iro and others. Um, and so that's like a great way in which we've um, helped you know, spread that talent funnel goodness. Um, a lot of teams have done a ton of work on developer experience, getting things like test ground up and running and working on every single lib P2P PR is a core way in which we've been improving that. Um, and then finally, externalizing the directions we're heading and also making available lots of RFPs, dev grants, and other ways of, of aligning ourselves with other groups across the network and, and shooting for a, a unified goal, which we can all work on together. And so um, those are kind of the, the four main areas of our, our talent funnel contribution in Andres. Um, we've also then worked on two critical sections of growing the capability um, within uh, the whole IPFS and Filecoin ecosystems. The first around robust storage and retrieval, making sure that a decentralized storage network is actually accessible, robust, and you can build amazing immersive and, and useful applications on top of it. Um, this has been a core focus for this past year, both with data onboarding and with the focus on actually making sure that you can retrieve and access that data smoothly. You know where it's located, you have reliable data transport, tools um, that when you onboard lots of data, you can actually um, you know, get, make use of it within, within Filecoin um, and within, within IPFS as well, and making sure there's a smooth um, connection between all of the different IPFS nodes that are operating in the network. So this has been core focus um, and continues to be. Um, we also have done a ton of work around breakthroughs in programmability, scalability, and compute. So this is taking early research ideas, pushing them through early, um, you know, uh, test nets and early um, releases over the course of the year, things like FVM going from M0 in January of last year to M0.5 in, uh, uh, I think it was like March, um, then M1 in July, and now leading up towards M2. And so working on bringing those, those new breakthroughs all the way from, you know, research idea through to uh, real conception and adoption. Um, so that's been a, a core focus for us. This is, you know, core to what we do, right? We upgrade these networks we work on with new superpowers that then many other people can build upon and can create their own new capabilities that they want to add to these networks as well. Um, and then finally, critical network operations. Obviously, there is a lot that goes into keeping these networks robust and scaling to all of their new usage, 12 million weekly uh, gateway users, I think that's what it was doesn't just happen. There's a lot of work that actually goes into making that a reality. And so um, keeping our systems running, but not just running, scaling, growing, releasing new versions, releasing new improvements, um, and kind of paying back old technical debt from, um, from previous years is a core part of us being able to actually achieve any of our goals. Um, and so you know, started, starting from the bottom, that's our foundation for any of the other work we want to be able to do. Okay, so now we are going to jump into each of these areas and highlight a little bit more deeply um, the work that they're doing. Um, these were, by the way, the, the top level kind of objectives we sent for ourselves, mapping to those, um, those areas, scaling the developers on the PL stack, robust accessible storage and retrieval of data, launching network breakthroughs, and keeping critical team and network systems running. So yeah, we're gonna jump into talent funnel. Um, 
This was a, a slide that we looked at at the very beginning of the year for the folks that were with us then, um, highlighting some of the, the areas that we um, kind of took, took initiatives around, so moving our communications to, to other channels. Um, this is just an overview, though. I'd really love to invite the, the people in this area up so that they can talk more about their specific parts. Uh, I guess I'm first. Working in public. Um, great. That was the, the first area that, that we kind of took on, was making sure that we're doing our development openly so that we can externalize all of our knowledge and we can also collaborate more effectively with other teams. So um, amazing work from Steve and others on actually moving our Endres communication channels um, out of Protocol Lab Slack and into more open communication um, forums like Filecoin Slack and IPFS Discord. So check, we are now working more openly in those areas. We've published over 30 mother of all demo day demos, which is awesome. Um, these videos are all online and, and open on YouTube. Anyone can go check them out. There's some really, really cool ones um, more recently. We have over 4,000 Endres all hand views of people who are using those all hands to get a deeper sense of the areas that we're working on and also as a conduit for, for knowledge on how different systems are uh, being architected, and you know, when we're, we're hiring amazing new people, many of them are saying, wow, I saw the work that you were doing here, and I wanted to be a part of making that happen, or I wanted to collaborate on this area. So it's amazing as well as, as a way to interconnect us into the network and bring in awesome new talent into these ecosystems. Um, and finally, we do uh, weekly sit reps from each team, situation reports on what's happening, what are our challenges and risks um, and opportunities. And we've had over 500 of those published in the past year. So freaking awesome. On to David. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so when it comes to externalizing R&D knowledge, uh, we basically focus in three pillars. The first one being events and collapse. So the ResDev labs have been the, or the labs uh, from uh, NGRES have been uh, the most consistent in putting out events and bringing the whole community together to learn about our development, our progress, and also our open problems. Uh, we have had events uh, pretty much every month this year, and uh, some events were uh, from our own, others were in partnership with many other uh, conferences that were happening. And thanks to that, uh, we actually had a lot of like really important uh, projects in the space uh, coming to 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 these events and like starting collaborations with us. The second pillar, research results. Okay, if we, if we need to externalize R and D knowledge, uh, we have to have something to to externalize. And so our um, our researchers have been very prolific. Uh, well, yet another year, publishing many results in top tier conferences all around the world uh, throughout. The year and also being part of like program committees and and um, and reviewers in in many other other conferences that are happening. Um, we have launched multiple RFPs, uh, given out multiple grants, and even had some breakthroughs that we could have uh, that we learned yesterday during Nicola's presentation that of things that we thought to be impossible last year. It's very remarkable. Uh, the the third one is really presence and stewardship, right? So it's very important for us to be able to shape how. Uh, the direction in which research is happening in the wider space, and that has been done by creating like these gravitational uh, pools, these gravitational centers from uh, starting with the websites from each of the labs that describe all of the projects that are happening, and uh, give everyone an update not only on the projects, but the status of the project, the open problems that exist, and also inform people about the roadmaps so that other teams in the ecosystem can really plan accordingly knowing those roadmaps. There is, this is like, um, a few things that of the many that happen, we have like a full complete snapshot. Wow, this is bright. Um, uh, that has been shared and uh, well, I hope you all can uh, take a look at it at some point and uh, leave some comments, ask some questions. All of the folks are here and so they are available to answer your questions and discuss more. And yeah, thank you. Good stuff. So some other network native development uh, efforts where we're working first and foremost uh, with a public network of teams rather than a centralized hierarchy of uh, internal teams that we're organizing by getting out more knowledge and incentive structures to grow the overall network. Some of the fruit that we saw here, we got multiple new IPFS implementations, including Elastic IPFS and IRO came out. We have a new LIP2P implementation and Swift LIP2P. Uh, yeah, this is a multi-org effort around all the grants and RFPs, certainly with Outer Core and Filecoin Foundation. Um, but a lot of the people in this gr group are involved in either pitching some of these grants or certainly reviewing them and validating that we actually got the results that we wanted. So 
Uh, when, when we say open grants here, these are like more openly defined, but these were you know, fully funded and being executed on grants. So many across the Filecoin, uh, with the Filecoin Foundation, with the Fi uh, Filecoin Dev Grants, IPFS Dev Grants, and um, uh, Tef for, with Tef for Labs and Radius, you know, we had 15 complete grants across IPFS, the P2P, and Filecoin, and multiple that are still in progress. So a lot of activity here uh, in terms of incentive structures. And then in terms of giving direction for where we're going, uh, effort all across Filecoin, IPFS, and libp2p around specifications. Um, so these are the stats pulled from 2022 in terms of how many of these specs were either updated or improvement proposals landed. And as you can see, you know, this, these are all done through GitHub and pull requests, you know, usually around 50 plus for each of these projects. And you know, yes, some of these are small, but some of these are uh, mammoth efforts in terms of community polls. Some of these have hundreds of comments to actually get them landed. Uh, and you can see, you know, it's not just a select few that are making these happen. These are um, dozens of people across multiple organizations, and then when these land, they very much impact the work that others are doing. So um, great work to all involved. Thanks. Yeah, great. Uh, the Starfleet recruiting team really found their form this year, uh, and it's obvious from the you know, number of new faces in this room uh, that we're in a, an entirely new world of uh, growing our team and growing our capabilities uh, compared with PL of the past. Um, so, so across 2022 so far, you know, three quarters of the, of the way in, uh, there were more than 1,400 interviews performed uh, within engi engineering uh, and research. Um, we have 122 teaching and training and mentoring to uh, Launchpad participants uh, to help spread that knowledge uh, faster and better. Uh, I think the, you know, my favorite part of the impact here is this is not just, just a matter of effort but we're improving the systems, improving the processes, improving the automation, improving the reliability with which we can do this. And so uh, the recruiting team and the, uh, in collaboration with you know, the interviewers and, and hiring managers in Andres um, have delivered uh, new interview training, new interviewing rosters. We have metrics, we have training metrics, we understand the system, we know how to improve it. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to you know, even, even greater things next year as, as we continue to grow from here. Hi, I'm Peter uh, from IPDX team. Uh, my main focus is improving developer experience uh, within IP stewards team through tooling and automation. But certainly, that's that's not. Uh, well, we we try to think beyond that group, and I hope you were able to see our presence all around PL throughout the year. Uh, actually, like this time last year, the team didn't even exist yet. Uh, so that was like one of the main things we did throughout the year to, to bootstrap the team, think a lot about team identity and long-term vision. Uh, but we also did bring some, some improvements uh, throughout the network. So one of the first projects we, we focused on was Unified CI. We joined Martin uh, and helped with, with maintenance of the project. Throughout the year, we, we brought, uh, we <coughs> made two, two major releases, which coincided with major Go version releases. Uh, and we merged uh, over 250 50 PRs, which uh, updated Unified CI uh, in various repositories, and majority of those were merged automatically. Uh, but we don't focus only on Go there anymore. Uh, with Alex, we implemented uh, support for JavaScript CI in Unified CI, and uh, by now, that reaches almost 80 repositories across our organizations. Uh, the other project we focused on was GitHub management, which is a way to, to manage GitHub configuration through, through code. So you might have seen that uh, around in various places already. <laughs> uh, and we already had almost 400 PRs throughout uh, 10 repositories. And even last week, we, we bootstrapped GitHub management in two new organizations. So clearly getting traction, and that's, that's really exciting. <laughs> uh, test ground, yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the pillars of our work. We, we revived the project throughout last year, uh, focused heavily on stability, uh, which enabled us to, to actually start running uh, test ground tests in lib P2P, on, uh, in Rust and Go on every PR. Uh, and what else? Oh, yeah, last but not least, uh, we, have, we also uh, tried to improve security in various various places, one of which was uh, we, we bootstrapped the effort to uh, rotate 
npm tokens throughout our repositories in all of our orgs so that that we use shared npm tokens not tied to to any single developer that that makes the whole setup uh, more secure and and scalable and uh, yeah finally thank you all for your participation because without you none of this would be possible and yeah we hope to see you next year as well Amazing. So again, we made a lot of improvements across the whole talent funnel um, area within Endres, hitting kind of that top strategy goal. Um, and our next focus was on robust storage and retrieval. Anyone who's going to talk about storage and retrieval, please come hang out up here. Um, in, in storage and retrieval, this is really at the core of what we do, right? You need to be able to store data in decentralized networks. You need to be able to retrieve it from many retrieval clients across browsers, IPFS nodes, um, IPFS desktop, all sorts of other um, amazing Web3 powered tools. Um, and this is really core to the mission of Filecoin. If we're going to create a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanity's information, you got to have robust storage and retrieval. Um, this is core for IPFS as well. You want data to be accessible to everyone, and you also want it to persist long term, and you want to be able to work seamlessly with long term verifiable storage networks like Filecoin to make sure that data sticks around and is accessible to you, you know, long in the future when you're not necessarily running the original IPFS node that you were running um, at that moment in time. Um, so we had a big focus around um, enabling seamless data onboarding onto Filecoin, um, focusing on making retrievals reliable, immense progress in that. Um, I'm sure Jacob will give us a, a peek into what that looked like at the beginning of the year versus today and just helping support all of the adoption of storage and retrieval across IPFS and Filecoin. So. All right, folks, so that big uh, uh, happy graph that we keep showing up with the curve going up and to the right uh, is actually the result of like many, many weeks of work from the data programs, the client growth, the SP growth, and many other teams to enable, like at some point we felt that we had to break physics first in order to, to get to the scale of that onboarding that we are today. And thanks to so many projects from like Syncjot Evergreen, Syncjot V3, uh, Falcon Plus, uh, accelerating um, how it uh, distributes data cap to clients, uh, the data conservation house and big data exchange. Uh, we managed to grow this year from uh, having 200 terabytes of data onboarded a day to uh, consistent 2,500 terabytes, so that's 2.5 terabytes uh, on a 30-day moving average. This is really impressive. Like we didn't thought it was possible. Woo! Yeah. And so yeah, and this is just like the beginning of many many things. We have a uh, an ambitious goal of actually getting to the five uh, terabytes a day uh, by the end of the year. And uh, well. Things are looking good and there are many projects coming in with Cybertruck kind of like breaking the boundary uh, of the internet bandwidth and actually taking data directly to SPs uh, with uh, Cod Bacalhau like enabling uh, a market for data set derivatives that will enable new data sets to emerge from the SPs directly and many more initiatives like moon landing, enterprise fuel and so on. So very exciting. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm talking about um, following up on what Dovey just said. Um, a big data exchange. Um, we are also uh, we, we observe there's like a big um, there's lots of block reward subsidy um, being given on the network, and we want to how can we harness those subsidy to incentivize more participants and more clients joining the network. So, uh, big data exchange is uh, using is using an auction mechanism to really auction off data sets uh, from clients to to minor, or it could be the other way around, from minor to client, depending on the market dynamics. And so far, the platform has transacted 10% of all the Falcon Plus on the network, and it's growing really rapidly. And this is also moving towards a protocol kind of uh, platform where you can build different kinds of front end. Oh, I think the slide is not updated. There's another um, auction house called Data Conservation House that you can use the same global liquidity pool to transact um, data on the Falcon network. And uh, at Crypto Econ Lab in our network, we always monitor this kind of network dynamics to really detect um, evolving opportunities like this. So if you have new ideas and new possibilities, please come talk to us. Thank you. Hello. I'm here representing the DAG House team, formerly known as Nitro. And the DAG House team has been really hard at work improving the Web3 storage platform and growing it. 
and making content address data uh, available over IPFS and stored in Filecoin deals, the number one storage medium for Web3 data. At this point, we are at 170 million plus uploads. This about a year ago was about 15 to 20 million. So it's a huge amount of growth, uh, over 85,000 plus users, including a lot of the largest NFT marketplaces and minting websites, as well as a lot of cool other Web3 projects. Altogether, I think this clocks in at around 800 tebibytes of data. So compared to, to the 2.5 PIBs being onboarded a day, not a lot, but going, coming from the other side, that's still a, a lot of NFTs being stored on Filecoin. Uh, we also launched our own HTTP gateway back in March called W3Link. It's grown at an over 25% week over week clip since then, serving over a billion requests now. And uh, just also wanted to give a shout out to uh, the deployment, the creation and deployment of a new IPFS implementation uh, called Elastic IPFS that drastically improved our services reliability and scalability. Um, so if you haven't checked that out before, uh, it's on GitHub, please check it out. Thanks everyone. Hello, I'm Too Many Slides Guy from Bedrock. So if we go back to January, uh, there was no way to find content on Filecoin. You had to know where it was. So, and if you knew where it was, there was less than a 30% chance of actually getting the data without manual intervention. Uh, and our visibility into this was really low. Uh, Markets tooling was also really limited for SPs. And a lot of time, again, manual intervention, offline deals to get around it. So where are we at today? So right now, over 27% of Filecoin SPs are announcing their content to indexers, which means data is now discoverable, with an estimated 25% of all Filecoin deals uh, currently being found via the indexers. So CID Contact Indexer, which is Bedrock's uh, indexer, is one of six partner indexers, which indexes over 5 billion CIDs every week. We're also expanding indexing to IPFS. Uh, thanks to support from the Reframe protocol, we already have the IPFS Collab cluster fully indexed. We also operationalized AutoRetrieve, which is issuing about half a million requests every week. Uh, and we've also doubled success rates from 30% to 65%, over 65% in the last three months alone. With this, we've also drastically increased visibility. So this, you can see BitSwap requests all the way through GraphSync, and we get a full breakdown, you probably can't see, because I'm in the way, uh, of all errors being listed. So we know who's blocking content, who's rate limiting content, and where our software needs to be improved. So we also launched Boost in June, which has been adopted by over 100 SPs, representing over 440 petabytes of quality adjusted power on the network. And recently in Slingshot v3, they have elected to mandate Boost, which is pretty sweet. Um, so Boost expanded additional tooling for storage providers. So we've got peace retrieval over HTTP, remote copy for storage, improved visibility and logs, and more coming. And then also, if you come to IPFS camp, you'll be able to see Kubo retrieving directly from Filecoin. Thanks. Okay, hello, Lisa for the IPFS Gateway. Um, if you've never, never heard about us, it's a great thing. That means we do the work. Uh, everything is silent happening. Uh, this is a number we put together to show how important this uh, infrastructure it is. Uh, from the first deliver, from like, 70 seconds to five seconds, uh, unit user from 2.2 million to 12.8 million. The request from like 0.5 trillion to 1.8 trillion. So everything happened under the thing. You probably didn't see it, but uh, you can see the number. Uh, the team doing a great job. Hoping we keep working on this, make sure even better. Uh, you will hear more about our roadmap uh, tomorrow. So this is the sum of the data we want to share with the team. This is how other people are using IPFS Gateway. Uh, we have a breakdown for the 200 reference. Um, you can see. Our user come from everywhere with a different purpose. Uh, this is um, kind of a proof to us the gateway we are doing, it is really useful for the network and really useful for the real work. Thank you. Hey, I'm Patrick. Um, yeah, the Retrieval Markets Lab has been hard at work <coughs> in 2022 on a couple of projects in particular. The first is Saturn, a decentralized CDN for data stored on Filecoin. Um, Saturn is currently serving, we're testing with 100, 160 million requests a day and 66 terabytes of bandwidth being shifted as well. Um, the time to first byte performance is almost twice as fast as IPFS Gateway, which is really exciting. And we're now exploring with the IPFS Gateway team potential integrations. Uh, over the last month, we've launched the Saturn Sunrise program 
which is 14 external teams <coughs> running L1, opera, L1 nodes in the Saturn network and working with the Saturn team on that. We've also got the Saturn L2 nodes um, running in the Saturn testnet on the station desktop app. So that is our second uh, project as part of the Retrieval Markets Lab, Filecoin Station. Filecoin Station is a desktop app for the Filecoin network. It's currently available to download from, from GitHub uh, and it immediately sets you up running a Saturn L2 node. Um, and it really is about allowing anyone to join the Filecoin economy, not just people who know how to set up a, uh, a storage provider. Uh, we're also exploring other modules to run in station, including with the compute over data uh, lab as well. Um, a station kind of grew out of just being a tool to run a Saturn L2 node, and then it was like, hey, we could actually do loads of stuff with this. So it'll be a deployment target for anyone looking to deploy any sort of module to a peer-to-peer -peer network of, of kind of devices running in home networks. Um, all of this will be talked about by members of the Retrieval Market Lab and others across the Retrieval Market Working Group on October the 27th, this Thursday. Um, so yeah, please come join the Retrieval Market Summit. Thank you. I Luca from CryptoNet. Uh, as CryptoNet, we have been working on retrievability. Um, what we got out of it is uh, retrieve.org. Retrieve.org is now launched on both Ethereum, Testnet, and Polygon, and it's a way to, to have a retrievability assurance on your data. What happens is like anyone can be a retrievability provider. The clients can make an ad hoc retrievability deal on an IPFS CID. And if the file cannot be retrieved by the client, it can go and ask a referee network to either provide the file or uh, slash the provider. We're gonna have a presentation at Retrieval Market uh, Summit. So I basically, I mean, feel free to, to, check, to check out retrieve.org and come to listen on our presentation. Thank you. Amazing. Um, everyone who is going to speak about breakthroughs, please come up to the front. I know there's a lot of them. Um, this is a super, super exciting piece of the work that we do um, across IPFS and Filecoin, which is helping kind of steward, grow, and then actually develop, deploy, and productionize um, new breakthroughs into the, the networks that we, that we work on. Um, this is bringing things like FVM, new L2 uh, capabilities, consensus improvements, computation, and other things to, to the networks um, and data being stored in IPFS and Filecoin. Um, so a ton of work here, and really we'll let the teams take it away. Can you hit reload? <laughs> Just last minute updates. <laughs> all right, so I'm Raul. Um, I'm going to be covering the FEM very quickly. So as you've all heard probably yesterday, the FEM project delivers on-chain programmability to the Filecoin network. Uh, looking back uh, this year, we shipped three, uh, three major milestones. Uh, milestone 0 and Milestone uh, 0 0.5 were all developer milestones. In Milestone uh, 0, we got the FEM syncing with mainnet for the first time, running the current code of actors that was uh, powering mainnet at that time. Uh, with 0 0.5, we made running that node possible for anybody in the community, so anybody could stand up a canary node against mainnet at that point in time. And then uh, with M1, we actually shipped the FEM uh, to the live network. Uh, we installed the FEM technology, um, and uh, this happened in July 2022. Uh, now, behind the scenes, uh, this was a massive change. It doesn't look like a mass. It doesn't look like a big change because the network continued operating normally. And kudos to all the teams that made that happen. But really, this was a massive change. We're literally changing the engine of, of a flight where it's while it's moving, while it's flying, right? So uh, we ship. We changed over 100,000 lines of code. Com this was an entirely new execution path in Falcon clients, a completely new actor's code base, a new bundling code, a reworked gas model, many repos affected, and three client teams collaborated in this effort. So that was Lotus, Forest, and Venus. Um, now, from then onwards, we moved on to M2.1, which is the milestone that we're working on right now. So this milestone brings the EVM runtime, ships the EVM runtime as the first runtime on the FEM, where users will be able to deploy smart contracts for the first time. Now, the Wallaby testnet is already online, and just uh, a few days ago, we managed to conduct our first MetaMask transaction on Wallaby. So that's a huge milestone for us. Uh, after this, we're going to be moving on to, uh, to enabling the deployment of WASM actors 
to the FEM, and from then onwards, we'll be moving on to, to perform further protocol improvements on programmability. Now, I just wanted to give you a, sorry, sorry about the brightness here again, but I wanted to give you a little bit of, um, of um, uh, of a view on what happened behind the scenes here. This is a massive engineering effort. Uh, M2.1 was very unclear at the beginning. It changed uh, scope several times. Uh, and we conducted an engineering uh, breakdown. Uh, from there, we went on to a high level plan. Uh, um, from that, so uh, once we once we got kind of like the scope tightened and locked down, we want to cat uh, we went on to catalog all the specs that we needed to write and kind of like all the design technical designs that we needed to work through. Uh, that led to an incremental delivery plan, which we then uh, kicked kicked off uh, Wallaby as a new testnet so we could deliver all of the work that was happening within 2.1 incrementally, literally every week we're, we're shipping releases, so we try to. And uh, we also have a massive developer community, big developer, a growing developer community onboarding into FEM, so we also launched the FEM forums. Um, as I said, we have a developer community coming into FEM. We've, learned, uh, we've uh, ran two foundry programs by now, uh, F1, uh, is, is running right now. This is early builders that are building on Febim, that are deploying use cases on Febim. These are some of the teams that are participating. If you know of anybody that is very curious about deploying, uh, working with, with Filecoin and, deploy, and deploying new, new use cases around programmatic storage and so on, then uh, let them know about, about the Foundry and tell them to apply. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Alex from uh, the CryptoNet team, uh, representing the protocol opportunities uh, team from CryptoNet. Uh, we deliver core protocol improvements with a big focus on, on Filecoin this year, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, setting the application uh, you know, development platform uh, so that when the FEM does enable those user programmable actors uh, and, and smart contracts, uh, we can build some amazing applications. So uh, the capabilities that we've been working on and unlocked this year um, uh, adding a beneficiary address to uh, the minor actor will allow on-chain collateral lending markets. Uh, we've simplified the QA power calculation, which is going to let us uh, update the data in sectors uh, so that the storage is reusable. Uh, we've decoupled the Filecoin Plus uh, mechanics from the built-in storage market, which is laying the, the groundwork for user program storage markets uh, in the future. Uh, a standard authentication method is going to allow smart contract wallets and actors and other you know, on-chain entities to make deals uh, with the built-in market and future markets. Uh, we designed account abstraction, which is going to be a key enabler for uh, the FEVM uh, when it launches uh, uh, early next year. Uh, it's also a, a, a um, critical, critical piece for uh, smart contract wallets and counterfactual interactions. Um, Ethereum and other blockchains wish they had account abstraction, and, and FEVM is going to have it uh, from the beginning. Uh, we've uh, designed a new proof expiration mechanism, which both allows us to increase sector commitments, uh, uh, upfront sector commitments in the future, and also gives us built-in network recovery mechanisms in case anything, anything ever goes wrong with our uh, proof uh, crypto. Uh, and also designed uh, token standards and are in, pro in progress uh, designing NFT standards uh, to help interoperability and composability of uh, um, both native and EVM actors. Uh, when the FVM opens up uh, for them uh, later on, uh, along with a bunch of other you know, FVM support and, of course, more FIPS in development uh, coming to a Filecoin near you soon. Hello, it is Nicola, and I lead uh, CryptoNet. And like we've seen before, all these improvements in Filecoin allow a whole new generation of storage protocols that can be built on top of Filecoin. And at CryptoNet, we're trying to explore what is the space in front of us. We've seen Retrieve.org. We also launched Web3 Bounty.app that allows to do a one MetaMask transaction to have your files stored on Web3.storage. Eventually, this would be straight into Filecoin. And there's a whole bunch of storage products, and we have a roadmap for uh, what are the products and the primitives for building these products. So we talk about the Web3 storage bounty, the retrieval pinning, but there's way more. There is uh, the perpetual storage and repair protocols this is the field of auto-renewal contracts that we're going to be looking into next. But there is a lot more. Whenever you want to automatically, automatically uh, recreate a deal, you want to make sure that you pick a good miner. So we need better metrics for miners, and we have storage metrics now that is now spanning across several teams that are building uh, tools for making that happen. And then um, there's proving data on the clear. There is um, the Filecoin Oracle that could be exported into other chains so that other chains can see if data are stored or not. And these primitives allow for Filecoin storage to not just be the storage market that we use today, but way more. I'm just gonna give a quick overview. 
on chain storage is this uh, website that we launched uh, for LabWeek and describes what is the different work that we're looking into for making storage more programmable in Filecoin and on, on other chain. And the goal is to also eventually offer a dashboard so that lets you see what in, the, so for example, this is my wallet and this is the data that I'm storing. This is the different storage products that I'm using. And then you can go on a single CID and you can see who's storing it, who's providing retrieval, who's paying for insurance. And not only, in the future, you should, this, this is live today. It doesn't look as cute as this, but as soon it's gonna look as cute as this. And eventually you're gonna be able to just add a deal on a CAD so you can participate in crowd storing uh, a file. All right, uh, hello from the Filecoin crypto team. So um, one big thing that we shipped this year was the snap deals, which was a new proof. And of course, like it included a trusted setup, which is a lot of work. It takes months to do and shipping data all over the place. And of course, we also improve things, for example, like the GPU acceleration. So we um, put out like tightly integrated code into a separate library so that other, also other people working in the cryptographic space can use GPU acceleration and easily integrate it into their things. And of course, there's also like impactful things that shouldn't have any impact, which is vulnerabilities. So uh, we, of course, also fix those. So in case people are scared, like, so this, the frozen hard one was not one specific to Filecoin, but it was generally in a cryptographic protocol and we just like reviewed our code and also saw that there might be problems with our things. So the short version is, if you hash things, hash everything you have and not only parts of it. Um, and of course, there's Halo 2 that you might have heard floating around and we are already there that we have the current proofs are already ported um, to Halo 2 and I already successfully sealed a 32 gigabyte sector with Halo 2 today. And yeah, so yeah, that's all. Okay, so I'll talk about vector commitments. This year we are looking at changing the old fashioned Merkle trees in Filecoin with something new and fancy, which are vector commitments. This is an algebraic uh, cryptographic primitive that allows for shorter proofs, better verifier, uh, functional opening, like not only membership uh, proofs for one element, but for many values. And the main problems to make this practical was to have some space-time uh, trade-offs as in Merkle trees. So we, we allow the storage provider to uh, trade some storage for uh, faster computation in the opening uh, of their values. And this is Muppets, a new scheme that allowed to plug in any algebraic vector commitment into a tree structure. So we make the same kind of trade-offs that we have for Merkle trees. Um, they are using the same uh, trusted setup as uh, Grod 16, so Power of Tau ceremonies. It's ready to implement right now. Uh, we have everything we need at the description in a paper. So everything is out. We just need people motivated to look it more into it for Filecoin. And another missing piece was to link this up with other proofs that we have in Filecoin, and those are proof of replication, and that's Colk. And Colk allows us to make the vector committed uh, compatible with other SNARKs that prove replication in our. So if you are interested to find out more, the papers are out, they are accepted in, uh, in cryptographic conferences, and we have uh, talks about these primitives in, uh, uh, in our Vector Commitment Day event and in uh, ZK Study Club. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Mara from CryptoNet. Um, so currently, Falcon uses Grot16 for proof of space, and Grot16 is great because it uses like the shortest proof. It creates the shortest proof, di proof in the literature, and also does very fast verification, um, constant actually. However, it has a very slow prover um, that uh, does very expensive arithmetic operations, and also like if we change anything about the Falcon proof, we need to rerun the pre-processing part that performs computations to help the provers and the verifiers. On the other side of the spectrum, we have SNARKs with fast provers, and uh, the fastest in the literature right now is Spartan. Um, these have transparent setups, which mean like everyone can do the pre-processing. There's no like secret involved like in Powers of Tau. Uh, however, these have a long proof and a slow verifier that like if we integrate in the blockchain, we'll probably kill the network. So, 
in order to get the best of both worlds, uh, CryptoNet is trying to combine uh, Spartan and Growth16 uh, in order to get a universally trusted setup, with me, which means like we run it once and like whatever we changed uh, in the Falcon proofs, we don't have to rerun it. Um, we expect a faster prover when this is ready, uh, up to between four and 20 times faster. Um, a, the, a proof as short as Growth16 and the cost in time very far. And we see in this graph what we've run right now, um, that the Studo performs much better than uh, the Grot 16 prover. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm talking about Mediza today, which is another thing we are building off in, uh, of CryptoNets. And Mediza is an uh, auction access control mechanism, so you have uh, apps that can define their access control on-chain using their own language, smart contract, or anything you want. And then it delegates the access to the content to uh, a threshold network. So if you, for some of us who know DRAN, it's very similar to DRAN, except now uh, when you request content, then the Mediza network will re-encrypt towards your key, your, uh, specifically, uh, key, and so you're only, only, the only one that can decrypt quickly. And so uh, everything is backed by cryptographic proof, so you can see in the nice diagram here, uh, you have many, many contracts that can use the Medusa smart contract. They all interact with Medusa via this interface. You can use it, there's no registration needed, anybody can use it, no worries. Um, it's already live on testnet, it's not live on FVM yet, but it's gonna come soon this year, we hope. Uh, and you can visit the website for more information. And also on the roadmap, we include uh, global public decryption. So for those who know who heard about the run time decryption, is gonna be very similar. And uh, that's about it, I won't keep your time long. So check out the website and the demo, bye-bye. So just a brief overview of what Consensus Lab was doing. We didn't figure out that we should invite all 15 people that we grew to, uh, to have a slide, but actually this growth was the most important thing for Consensus Lab. So we grew from four people at the beginning of the year to 15 actually in a month, and that was amazing. And then we, do, we didn't only spend money, we actually did some nice work. So we are focusing on two things. So we have a development uh, thread and we have a research thread. So we are very present in research communities. So lots of publications, lots of chairing of uh, conferences and so on, lots of PC committees. So we are really paying attention to that. And then to actually implement our ideas and help the Filecoin ecosystem, we have these two main ideas that you heard by now. So this is interplanetary consensus, ex-hierarchical consensus which basically will allow us to spawn subnets from the Filecoin mainnet and then do different things that we want to do on these subnets, plus consensus to power the total order in these subnets, right? As opposed to expected consensus on the Filecoin mainnet. So these are the two main things. So we started the Q1 with the IPC, we delivered the IPC design and the first uh, MVP, which was in Udico, and Udico is a fork of Lotus, which we use for experimentation, but our like two main uh, actors were in Go at the time. So slowly we were transitioning to FVM and we are following the footsteps of FVM. So in the end, these two actors are going to be uh, user-defined FVM actors and these are governing IPC. Uh, at the, we kicked off at the, at the beginning of the year, Q1, when team was actually formed for MIR consensus development and then we, now we have the MIR MVP and we are currently here. So we are launching the SpaceNet testnet uh, in Q4. So this will have first uh, mere consensus protocol, like a standalone testnet with FVM uh, as, we are, uh, as we are following, right? But the consensus is not expected consensus, but this mere consensus. And then in Q, Q1, we are going to start spawning subnets from that testnet. And we are, so, we are hoping to go to the mainnet uh, in Q3 next year. So that's one big thread. The other big thread is actually uh, expected consensus security analysis that we conducted and for which we are uh, actually going to launch public FIP discussion just, I think, this week, I hope, because we are ready for that. And we expect the expect uh, expected consensus patch on mainnet uh, Q1 or Q2 next year. Thank you very much. Um, hi, I also didn't realize I was supposed to have 12 people up here. But, um, uh, I'm Dave Ronchek. I lead Compute Over Data. Um, Compute Over Data is really two things. Uh, the first is we launched a brand new working group 
Um, this is a working group of about 15 people, about or 15 companies, about 75 people who are working together in the open source community across PLN, uh, across you know anyone out there who wants to participate in uh, overall identifying ways to improve compute, um, uh, decentralized compute. And again, it can be Filecoin specific. It can be just decentralized web. Con uh, it could be Web 2. Uh, we're totally good with that. Um, in addition to working together, we're also working on a number of standards, um, invocation standards, authentication standards, pipelines, so on and so forth. We're collaborating around these things to try and figure out exactly, you know, what we can do to swap in and out from different projects. Uh, we have bi-weekly meetings and it's extremely active group. We're really pleased with how quickly it's growing. Uh, the other thing uh, we're doing is uh, we've also launched Bacalhau. So, um, I was last night at two o'clock in the morning. I'm going over this slide, and I was looking back at the timeline. I was like, "This can't possibly be correct," but it really is. On January 26th, there were zero human beings in the world working on this thing. On January 27th, the first very terrible line of code was checked in by me uh, into the repo. Uh, eight weeks later, we had our first Compute Over Data Summit, attended by 75 people and a proof of concept live in the world. Uh, eight weeks after that, we were live. You could actually go out there to the public with no authentication whatsoever, begin interacting with it. Eight weeks after that, you can interact with uh, Estuary, so you can read your data wherever it is on IPFS, perform your compute, and write it to Estuary in a uh, verified deal. Uh, and, um, and as of next week, we will be declaring uh, beta. So um, we're really, really excited, and we're going like mad. Um, a lot of people ask, what can you do with it? Uh, you can do Python, you can do R, you can do Go, you can do JavaScript. Basically, if you can contain it, you can run it. And uh, we would love for you to prove us wrong, but um, David Gaska is over there. He, he wrote a database running on it. Like, it's the nuts, most craziest thing in the world, and, and it works. So uh, there you go. Uh, you can use GPUs, you can do sharded jobs. It's up to you. Um, and uh, our goal is to be live by uh, Q2 of next year, V1, meaning... Uh, you know, not that it's not, your data already is there and being written, uh, but we want to declare API stability. And in order to do that, that obviously requires quite a bit of engineering. And so our goal is to hit um, very early in Q2 of next year. And uh, today, I would argue that it is among the easiest ways to read from IPFS and write to Filecoin today. And if you want to see some absolutely abusive demos, uh, please come to IPFS camp or our uh, Computer for Data Summit and you will see me doing um, absolutely terrible things. Uh, and there's your instructions if you want to go try it out yourself. Awesome. Uh, that's freaking cool. So uh, thank you to all of our, our breakthrough presenters. Um, now for really the, the meat of what, what we're doing here, driving critical network operations, making sure that we're keeping critical systems running, we're improving them all the time, um, and we're ensuring that they're secure and constantly burning back um, tech debt or operational debt that make it hard for us to keep running these things as they're scaling massively. These new breakthroughs are launching into networks. We have massive new amounts of users. And at the same time, we also want to be in improving the foundations that all that work is happening upon. Um, and so this was kind of a, how we'd broken down our objective at the beginning of the year, making sure that we define, implement, and maintain good ownership practices, release often, um, and then we also keep security, availability, and performance very, very top of mind. Um, and this is, you know, if we don't do this right, nothing else matters because you don't have a system, you've lost your users, you've broken the foundation upon which they're doing um, their work. So uh, this is really, really the, the foundation of everything else we've heard today. Hi, I'm Jennifer from the Lotus and Actor Field Dev team. I wish I had like 20 more like, people can join me here, but like we are still a very small team. But we haven't killed the network yet. The network is still alive. There's some zero incident in the past year, so things are doing pretty well. Uh, while keeping like things running, we ship a couple of Filecoin network upgrades uh, with um, bringing the research work into the Filecoin production like mainnet. And the first one being the only 15 oh snap uh, which <laughs> which enables storage providers in the Filecoin network to store clients data uh, in the co um, committed capacity sectors in Filecoin within a snap by snap I mean before it's gonna take like four to six hours to do this whole thing but right now if you have a sector already there it, as Nicholas shows here it only take him like less than 15 minutes to onboard some data into a 32 gig bags of like uh, storage. Uh, so that's like pretty amazing. And also as you can see in the past eight months, I would say, um, there are 72 
pip of data that is snapped into the network, it's not like a lot, but we are picking up, you know, like as the network trying to onboard more data, we hope people like uh, snap like more often. The next one, the one makes me the most nervous, but like the, again, what the, the network is still uh, alive with FVM. So that's why we started to summon the Rust place into the Filecoin network. Uh, we basically started to transform uh, Filecoin into a Wasm based virtual machine with FVM, and also we switch from the go spec actor to Rust built in actor, which breaks some souls, but also, you know, make people feel alive again, but like dealing with the code. Uh, however, uh, the Falcon network is running built in actor right now. Uh, we have a constant addressable code CIDs. We are actually uh, charging the gas for the actual like Wasm execution costs. And as like Ron mentioned, it's not like programmable just yet, but we are hoping to ship uh, F F FM uh, in next like uh, February. Uh, the last but not least, the shark is about to be released hopefully next month in November. And this is the one of the biggest like upgrade for the for the like, year. As you can see, there are many fibs uh, presented by A North. So uh, we are delivering deliver like a wave of like protocol refinements so that we can allow like when the fam is there, people can deploy different use cases on top of FEM. So we're doing a lot of the active refactory over there. And the core here, we are decoupling Falcon Plus from the marketplace. This is gonna be the foundation for different storage, uh, user programmable storage and market and help like incentive storage provider to st store like verified data with data cap uh, longer if anyone deserves. It's like data renewal in the network, so that's pretty cool. So again, it's coming soon. So, uh, so in the past, not in the past year, in this year, we are about to ship like three network upgrades uh, with three versions of Butane Actor, which is like pre-compiled smart contract in Falcon network uh, via three Lotus mandatory releases, uh, a total of 11 FIPS will be landed, and we also fixed like five protocol security, you know, bugs improvements uh, landed in the network. Uh, we don't only do network upgrades, we also have a software, like a client impl a reference implementation to maintain. So we have like kind of two tracks, we have the Lotus Core and the Lotus Manor. Uh, we also have the community, like Falcon community, that uses like Lotus, we are trying to support them. So for the Lotus Core, we are targeted at improving developer and node op operators experience, and Lotus Manor is the implementation that 98% of the Falcon uh, network is running. And uh, so we want to make sure they run the manner <laughs> and provide like storage into the network. So we ship like eight future releases monthly, nonstop. And for the Lotus Core, it's not Falcon network, I promise. Falcon network <laughs> is still alive. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, uh, so we are shipping like split store thanks to Zen. We are uh, and also like um, the groundwork was done by Viso. Uh, yeah, it will enable easier chain management for the gr uh, for the node operators with the growing Falcon states. Uh, our latest engineer Shunuj has implemented a Lotus node cluster using the rough consensus, uh, which this is going to increase the node redundancy uh, for the storage provider. And we are also launching the remote wallet manager will help user uh, manage their assets and uh, account better. Uh, for the Lotus Manor, uh, Magic has been nonstop like shipping things to make things like scalable and uh, make mining and providing uh, ceiling sectors into the Falcon network easier, faster. Uh, we ship post worker, so you can uh, you can win the rewards while proving the storage. Yay, nothing break. Uh, and also, again, Snap Deals is a huge combined effort with crypt uh, Field Crypto, CryptoNet. Uh, we have to integrate into that, that Lotus manner. We are enabling ceiling as a service. That means not everyone with storage has to have a tons of hardware and do a lot of, like, you know, DevOps to uh, enable to like join the Filecoin network. If you have the storage, you talk to your sitting as a service provider, you can join a Filecoin, a Filecoin as a miner. Um, we are doing a lot of like Lotus Miner refactor and re-architect just to make sure Lotus Miner as a software, we can keep up with the network girls uh, and support like more storage provider, provide enterprise level service. We also started our new team, TSC. I call them like Cho senior experts, but they are technical support engineers in the team, and they help us like supporting our users, onboarding a lot of the uh, community members to join the network. Uh, this year, we closed almost a thousand issues. I know that's crazy, uh, but that makes us like stay focused on like what's important. And also, uh, we merged 800. 
800 PRs. I don't know how we do that, but like I'm pretty sure this number is right. If not, whatever. <laughs> uh, but that's a lot of code being written. Uh, also, we launch our like Lotus homepage. We have the public like uh, roadmap uh, to the, our community. They know what we are working on. Uh, our TSC group has launched 30 uh, weekly Lotus newsletter, so that like you know all the information has been. Um, communi communicated with our community, and we have been creating a lot of the conceptual videos, tutorials to help people to understand this very complicated protocol. Uh, we have hosted three AMAs. Uh, we are joining a lot of the Falcon uh, events to educate people how to join the Falcon network. Uh, we are hosting our very first like Lotus and Friend Day, uh, November the second. If you are still uh, in town, please like sign up and talking to the team. And also, we started our Twitter and YouTube accounts. Please follow us. If you have any question, talk to the team. We're mostly here. Yes, I think that's that. Hi, uh, this is Birdie from Sentinel Team. I want to go over um, some upgrades and impact we had in 2022. Um, so first is the Filecoin Network Alerts Catalog we created this year. Uh, we currently have like around 20 uh, active alerts uh, leveraging the Sentinel data. Um, it's um, not <coughs> so it's uh, it's used to um, monitor not only Sentinel services but also um, uh, anomalies that's happening in our Lotus uh, network. So come come to us, let us know if you want to monitor um, any real time anomalies. Uh, please let us know. And for Lily, uh, we have around more than ten plus releases to support and track Filecoin upgrades and improvements. Uh, the other major change with Lily is to um, implement a distributed worker pool for higher performance chain indexing. Um, and we are currently migrating um, to um, CI/CD via GitOps. And uh, we work with our um, one of our power users, Starboard, closely this year. Uh, we hope to have more collaborations and uh, <clears throat> to accommodate their needs into our future milestones. Uh, it's, it's, it's very nice to meet uh, the lead from Starboard um, during the lab week, and uh, we'll have more discussion later this, this week. Um, for the PLDW side, um, we are moving toward uh, the unified data warehouse with uh, Google BigQuery. Uh, there are a couple of benefits. I think the first is fast, faster time to value and less operational work for the team. And uh, the second is possibility to join on-chain and off-chain data. Uh, we currently already have some um, Filecoin, um, Filecoin chain data in BigQuery, a backfill from our S3 data, and we are also migrating the Redshift data, uh, for, for example, for the Field Plus data into uh, BigQuery. So we, uh, going forward, it's possible to join this kind of data easily. And last but not least, uh, data, data pipelines managed with code, which will help us move faster uh, to ship data products and address that data request. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm ZX. Well, I'm back again. Um, I lead Crypto Econ Lab. At Crypto Econ Lab, our vision is to be an end-to-end R&D lab from protocol product ecosystem, centered around incentive, market, scale, PMF, and, and mass adoption. Well, I also thought there's only one slide per team, but don't worry, we are hosting two more events next week, a Field Lisbon Network Analytics Day on Monday and Crypto Econ Day on Tuesday. And um, given that vision, we broke our team up into like three um, sub sub teams. You hear more about them um, tomorrow. So from a core protocol to layer two incentive to ecosystem solutions and involvement. Uh, in the past year, we have been working on different incentive and mechanism mechanism design with many different teams, from like uh, interplanetary consensus, some the incentive to economics for infinitely scalable blockchain. It's, I, we think we are one of the groups who are actually thinking very deeply about all the economic issues related to like scaling blockchain. And also programmable storage markets, retrieval markets. You also hear about um, us giving presentation in the next week. And also Atlas and various uh, unique selling points of storing data on Filecoin. And we also uh, monitor and raise network health issues uh, through 536, which also involve many of us here. Um, from risk assessment, monitoring, simulation, modeling, scenario analysis, kudos to our team um, to putting a ton of work here and also working with uh, many of you guys. And uh, there's also design recommendation, also being involved with governance and um, full pool execution. Um, here's our website and then uh, there's also Crypto Econ Day. We will see you guys this week. Thank you.
the voice of Marcus from far away where he was probably asleep. Network infra scalability. Starting with API chain.love, we launched a new website, chain.love, with a tutorial and interactive API documentation backed by API chain.love itself. We have a new Lotus gateway design that allows horizontal scaling and rate limiting. In 2022, API chain.love was able to sustain over 200 queries per second, and we expect our new design to be able to scale well beyond that. We've been working on a GitOps Web3 platform to accelerate application productionization by offering a low friction self-serve GitOps deployment and hosting platform to get apps running at scale faster. We're targeting a general availability in Q1 2023. We've upgraded our full archive node data source to 64 terabytes in capacity. We we're previously limited at 16. Uh, the current full archive data source is, is sitting somewhere around 19 terabytes. So we should now have the capacity to store the full chain history for another two to three years. We plan to use our automated EBS volume snapshotting to publicly share our full archive data stores as well, making it easy for others in the PLN to run their own full archive nodes. Um, we are also um, planning to scale the core infra that powers the Filecoin network through decentralization, uh, defining impact evaluators and service levels to incentivize other organizations to run bootstrap and disputer nodes and ensure quality and uptime standards are being met. Expect a public dashboard tracking the official Lotus bootstrapper nodes that are baked into the Lotus binary. And finally, we will increase storage redundancy and decentralization from the um, artifacts and data that we produce on the fill for team. We will store chain snapshots and archives in Filecoin, IPFS, on-premises and in the cloud. And also, uh, we will store some of our full archive data stores in IPFS, on-premises, and the cloud. That's it for now. Thanks very much. Hey. Hello everyone. So I'm Yolan on the DRUN team. So the DRUN team, I'm not even sure it had slides last year uh, at Lab Week because it grew tremendously with two extra people <laughs> from two last year. So 100% growth, it's nice. Um, we've been launching higher frequency network on our test net with a three second test net running since over six months. We're planning to launch on mainnet in Q4 probably, uh, most likely with a six second network instead of three, we'll see. Uh, we've been able to launch the time lock encryption based on DRAND uh, back in August. That should come to mainnet also in Q4 with the updated uh, mainnet network we'll be launching because it will be using unchain randomness, which is also a new thing we introduced this year. Um, next, we've also been able to increase the observability we've got into the DRUN network, which is a huge network of 24 nodes right now. So it's very difficult to, you know, get good metrics from everyone and everything. Um, so now you, you can see our dashboard on the, on the right here. Um, behind the scene, we've been doing a lot of cleaning the code base and everything and bug fixes and, and that's been great. We've released a brand new TypeScript client um, that's actually not using Wasm this time, so it's way easier to use. Um, and uh, we've also been able to onboard two new uh, League of Entropy members in China, StoreSwift and IPFS Force. Um, StoreSwift, it's pretty cool. They've also been launching a new relay. And that's really interesting because something that was said once, I wasn't sure, I don't know, but I was told, is that uh, we were expecting storage provider to maybe have DRUN nodes inside their own data center, just like you would have your own NTP um, server inside your own data center. And that's exactly what's happening with uh, StoreSwift. So that's super exciting. Um, yeah, next we've been trying to grow the community around DRUN, especially since time lock encryption has a lot of broader applications compared to public randomness. So we've been going to conferences, um, publishing blog posts. Um, um, yeah, that's uh, ongoing effort. 
And if you want to talk to us, um, good luck. We've got our own Girand uh, workspace in Slack. Um, you might be able to find us in the NetApps channels. Hey, I'm Gus uh, from the IPFS Stewards. Um, so we own Kubo, which is the IPFS implementation, uh, formerly known as Go IPFS. Uh, this year, we, we spent a lot of time trying to get our release cadence uh, much faster. So we had six releases since the last lab week. And uh, um, we just recently switched over to a five-week release cadence, which is nice. Um, we, sh we shipped some things that have been lying around for a while, like Unix FS directory sharding, I think, which was four years in the making. Um, Circuit Relay V2 was turned on, which came from libp2p, which enables uh, users to have better NAT traversal. Um, we switched block stores from being keyed on SIDs to multi-hashes, which is a trivial change to make, but very non-trivial to roll out. Um, we added block and car response formats to the gateways, which is really awesome because it uh, enables verifiable retrieval for clients so that you, can, you don't have to trust the gateways uh, when you get the data from them. Um, uh, we shipped a lot of features from libp2p, including like resource management, which is also a very long-standing request from users, web transport, and we shipped uh, configurable delegated routing, uh, so that like content routing, peer routing, um, and and those kind of routings can be uh, configurable to like you can offload them to out-of-process uh, servers. Um, we also rebooted specs. So the, the IPFS specs had been sort of, uh, um, for a couple of years, they hadn't been well maintained. So we uh, finished the HTTP gateway specs, the IPNS specs, and we introduced the IPIP process, which is similar to FIPS, a little more lightweight. Um, we renamed Go IPFS to Kubo. And lastly, we renamed all the websites from ipfs.io to ipfs.tech. Uh, and we re-architected the Hydra boosters um, because, or to address some scaling bottlenecks. So they, they now handle, at peak, over 100,000 requests per second. And the DHT queries, as you can see on this graph on the left, dropped dramatically when we did that from 1.3 seconds to an average of 0.4 seconds to, to uh, resolve a provider record. Um, and the nodes in the network have grown up to 120% uh, to about 540,000. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. So in uh, Jazzland, we've had a very, very exciting year. It's the last uh, team, uh, sorry, the last lab week, the uh, lab week, yes. We have modernized our code base, more modern than before. You always got to keep it on the, uh, the bleeding edge uh, in JavaScript. So what's happened is we've ported, I mean, definitely bleeding edge, like there's blood everywhere all the time. Um, we've ported libp 2 p to uh, TypeScript, which has been fantastic. So we have uh, types that you can rely on now because they're actually generated from the code rather than being handwritten and then ho hopefully maybe they match up. Um, JS, IPFS, uh, sorry, JS IPFS itself is now ESM only. Uh, because there is no module loading system in JavaScript, apart from ESM. <laughs> CJS is a, is a user land, interesting user land heresy. Um, we've had lots of releases, so 15 of JS libp 2 p 14 of JS IPFS. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, solidifying the base and making uh, it a lot more resilient to attacks, particularly because now uh, JS libp 2 p is underpinning the TypeScript implementation of Lodestar, which is Ethereum 2. Uh, which is obviously a very adversarial environment for it to run in, so there, it's now a lot more stable and secure than it was before. Um, we have collaborations with Chainsafe and Little Bear Labs. These are external agencies. Um, so Little Bear Labs are implementing uh, the new uh, WebRTC transport, um, which is very exciting for going to be able to dial uh, Kubo nodes directly from the browser without needing to go via uh, web sockets and configure certificates and that kind of stuff. So this is this is super exciting. Um, definitely one of the takeaways from the uh, all thing in uh, Iceland was the connectivity story from browsers to Kubo nodes could definitely be improved. And this is this is part of that 
Uh, and yeah, so we're very excited about uh, delivering that very soon. Uh, we've shipped some new features. So we have uh, a DHT implementation. Hi. One of the, definitely one of the longest running things. There's no DHT in JavaScript. There is, you can use it. It's amazing, you should totally use it. Anything that says that is wrong. Like, anyone says that there's no DHT implementation is wrong. It is amazing and you should use it, please do. Um, we have Yamux now, so we can uh, finally retire Mplex. Um, this, this has been. <laughs> this is also thanks to Chainsafe, uh, who, who picked up the, um, the reins on that one, which is great. Uh, and uh, Marco, where's Marco? Is he in here? Marco has implemented the Web Transport Transport, uh, which is another way of dialing, you know, kind of slightly awkwardly named, but <laughs> we don't make the standards. Uh, <clears throat> the Web Transport Transport is another way of dialing uh, a Kubo node directly from the browser, um, which is fantastic. And so that's it. That's been the year in JSF. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm Russell, Sergeant Puki on the IPFS GUI and Tools team. Um, we just got restarted again this year, so. Um, I'm going to kind of skip the first part for a second. You know, we've got two full-time engineers now and a UX designer, so, so that's great. Uh, you can see the graph on the, on the left there that we've uh, significantly increased the amount of work that we're doing. Those are changes um, from showing a, a year ago, 2021 October, to now. Um, so this year we Im implemented the uh, pinning service compliance tool, which uh, helps show uh, pinning service providers meeting the pinning spec, and um, we've used that tool to validate pinning service providers' um, uh, functionality prior to then bringing them into the web UI and desktop app. So now we have some default service providers added to the desktop and web UI apps. Um, uh, we've also added a few features to desktop and web UI, such as publishing files to IPNS, managing IPNS publishing keys. Uh, there's also uh, pinning files, um, pending pinning files UI update, thanks to Hack. Uh, great work there. Uh, we've also got a, a process going now from restarting our engines, uh, establishing a cadence of getting some designs and then implementing those. Uh, we have published our roadmap. We're looking for feedback, really looking for um, input from the community and from Indrez on what you guys want us to work on. You know, there's a lot of different tools and different things we could be working on, a lot of uh, tech debt that we need to catch up on. But, you know, if there's something of higher priority you want us to work on, then let us know. Uh, you can see our star history over here. Desktop has been steadily climbing. I don't know if you can read those from the back, but there's a desktop, companion, web UI, public gateway checker, and then the pinning service compliance is tiny little green dot down here. I think it's got like seven stars or something maybe. Um, but yeah, so desktop is our highest start item. Then we've got companion, web UI, and public gateway checker has seen a spike this year. So all the gateway usage increasing, you know, eight times, uh, you know, we're seeing that kind of in the public gateway checker. That's it. Thanks. Uh, hi, folks. I'm Rod. Um, IPLD. IPLD has had a, a bit more of a humble year this year. Uh, we're, we're down to half a person. Um, <laughs> still, still working out which half, but <laughs> half, half a person and some contracting as well. But um, I've, cap I've captured here some of the core work, but it doesn't, it's not exhaustive. There's a lot of ecosystem work going on, and also notably Dag House is doing some really innovative stuff with IPLD that is not captured here, um, that w would be great to capture at some point as well. But um, anyway, stuff coming out of core um, worth highlighting. Um, one of the most notable things that we've uh, worked on this year is BindNode. Um, Daniel, who um, left earlier this year, um, he left us with BindNode, which is a brilliant piece of code in GoIPLD Prime. Um, it's, a, it's our most mature schema mapping layer. Um, we are in the process of, of investing in it and not so much in code gen, and we've, we've done a lot of replacing of uh, old code with bind node. Um, so we've, we've uh, worked on uh, robustness and productionization. 
Um, we've extended the feature set support um, and focused on reducing friction of using it, so less boilerplate, much more natural for uh, Go interaction. Uh, Massey put some numbers together earlier and um, saw a 10 to 15 times code reduction when you replace the code gen with BindNode. There's three major projects that he's uh, looked at for that. But also we, we deployed it in the Filecoin data transfer stack. Uh, that's led to simplification, uh, new messaging and management possibilities, um, and cleaner upgrade paths. Um, so some really interesting code going through that uh, data transfer stack. Uh, in JavaScript, uh, a few uh, things. Schemas updated and expanded, um, supporting the latest work. We've got brand new transformation and validation superpowers in JavaScript. Um, and notably, it's being used by uh, Mov is, is, has got some IPLD URL experimental work going on, pulling together schemas and ADLs and doing some really interesting stuff with URLs and IPLD. Some, so it's a great experiment to look at there if you, if you want to um, see some of the future JavaScript stuff. Um, Multi-formats, we, we had a, a very long upgrade to multi-formats version 10, and we've got a link interface now, which is really big news because uh, it gives us the possibility to reduce uh, dependencies. So every, pretty much everything in JavaScript that touches our stack pulls in this one library, multi-formats, um, and it's for C, the CID class. This, let, this gives you the option of, of having an interface so you can just do compatibility. Um, so it simplifies dependency. So going forward, that'll be interesting. Um, and also, Lots of ESM migration work with uh, lots of help from uh, Alex. Um, we're now in unified CI, CI um, and yeah, th this should simplify our dual published thing, which was crazy. Um, other, so IPLD patch was introduced, uh, and there's, some, there's a Go implementation, and there's also a, a JS implementation also in that IPLD URL um, experiment. Um, Launchpad, I'm, I'm pretty proud of this one. We, when Launchpad kicked off, we kicked off with a complete IPLD curriculum, um, and I, th I think it's been—I mean, it's been iterated on, obviously, but um, I, I think it was a pretty, pretty holistic curriculum for the beginning of Launchpad. Um, and lastly, keeping the lights on um, and being responsive to vulnerabilities, we've, we've stayed on top of vulnerabilities, made sure that things are stable and um, and all locked down. So there you go. Hello everyone, uh, it's me then. Uh, I'm going to talk about Problem. Uh, what we want to have at Problem is a data-driven protocol design uh, for IPFS and lib 2 p uh, Well, other protocols as well, but that's where we're focusing on right now. And we have two main lines of work. We focus on uh, kind, kind of small improvements, seem, things that might seem uh, very easy and very small to fix, such as looking at the DHT routing tables and seeing whether the information that is included in there is up to date. So, you know, your requests when you're asking the DHT are going to the right place. Um, which, yeah, we had good news. We have a very nice report published out of this. Uh, we focused on provider record and that's some ma magic numbers in there. So, uh, provider records is like your little advert to the network when you're publishing content. Uh, but if that is not in place, then your content is not findable. No one can reach it, so pretty important. Um, and we had some uh, really good results there, again, as a, a big report out. What we're doing is that we even f we found out that basically the, the situation in the network is very good, and we're even doing some improvements, which are supposed to come to, some, to the next um, Kubo release, or one after the next, something like that. Uh, and we're doing some big things as well. So. Um, we're taking up some big projects such as privacy in lib 2 p uh, which has been a long-standing commitment and we're, um, we're building one of the solutions, uh, which we hope that, um, yeah, will drive community, will get more community members to join and so on. Uh, and we're also doing uh, some uh, measurements on the nut hole punching. So, you know, peer-to-peer -peer networks, nuts, you know, uh, there is a solution which is unheard of and all credit goes to the lipid p team. But what we want to do is basically measure if it works well. Uh, so yeah, expect some news in the coming months. We are building the tools to do all that and uh, tomorrow in the roadmap I'm going to talk about what uh, our vision is on how to kind of integrate all of these in one place. Um, right now they're in standalone uh, GitHub repositories. Um, yeah, more than welcome to go and, and uh, check them up. 
And uh, finally, yeah, we're uh, interacting a lot with our big community. We've been in uh, several um, uh, high-tier conferences. We did our own workshop back in July. And um, yeah, we have even uh, first-time contributors to, uh, to the code base itself. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Hi, um, I'm Hector. I work in NetOps. Um, in NetOps, we do a bunch of things um, apart from Sentinel and some. One of, one of them is HyPFS cluster, which falls within the Bifrost team responsibilities. Um, NFT storage and Web3 storage people were very successful this year. And we had to support them, so they drove uh, like a huge amount of improvements into IPFS cluster that we use to orchestrate pins on, on IPFS. One of our, our biggest cluster is very close to hitting 100 million pins. We have another 40 million in a separate cluster. I think uh, it's one petabyte of data in one of them and getting close to that amount on the other. Um, so that, that was like a lot of improvements that we drove during that year to support that effort. Um, going forward, we're also working on the IPFS operator. It's the first time we actually <laughs> invest into figuring out how to run IPFS on Kubernetes along with cluster and how to make it well so that nodes have connectivity. We have the, I presented the prototype already in, in Iceland in the IPFS thing. We're gonna again um, present more improvements now in IPFS camp. And of course all of this goes together also with making content retrievable that includes gateways and you already saw the, the graphs are already like all these graphs that they showed you that are going up. Um, that involves managing a lot of infrastructure and scaling up the infrastructure, particularly uh, gateways. I don't know, we at least uh, had four, four more gateway nodes or ga gateway machines than we had before. So I think we have over 100 now. Um, reducing the time to first byte was already mentioned, increasing the number of requests that we can handle goes al along with a lot of improvements in the infrastructure in the back. How to, which disk layouts to use, which technologies, which type of caching to do, how to configure engines, how to handle failure requests and retries and so on. And all of this is happening behind the scenes so that hopefully you don't notice so much when something doesn't really work. Thank you. Hello, I'm Martin, I uh, work on the P2P. Um, our users had been asking us for the longest time to implement proper hole punching into the P2P. And actually they were surprised that we shipped a, li a library called the P2P without hole punching. So <laughs> um, we fixed that problem. We, we, we implemented it, we rolled it out. Um, uh, it's live on the IPFS network. There are more than a thousand relays, relay servers used to, to do that hole punching. And we've collaborated with Probe Lab, who've measured if this actually works. And uh, we have the numbers, and they look pretty good. So this is, this is shipped. It, it works. Um, the other thing that users had been asking us for, for the longest time is how do we connect browsers to the, um, to the network to... Um, to the IPFS network, for example. Um, so the, the answer we, we gave them uh, so far was like, yeah, you know, we uh, use web sockets and you need a host name for that and you need a TLS certificate and you had to set up everything manually and it was just a big pain. And so the, basically nobody did that. Um, we changed it this year. Um, we now have web trans the web transport transport, um, <laughs> uh, which allows you to just connect JS libp2p from the browser to any Go libp2p node without any configuration. You just start up your node and JS libp2p can, can connect to it. Woo! So that's pretty cool. Um, we are now working on, on WebRTC. Um, it's rolling out, uh, will be rolling out uh, the first part this, uh, later this year. Uh, the second part, the browser to browser connectivity will be rolling out um, early next year. So now you can also 
two browsers can talk with each other without any configuration needed. So that's pretty cool as well. We launched a website, connectivity.libp2p.io, that explains in, in detail how different nodes, if they are like Go nodes, Rust nodes, browser nodes, Node.js nodes, like what protocols they use to, to talk to each other. So if you're interested in that, just head to that website. And this was alluded to a little bit earlier, uh, but where libp2p is now more resilient against DOS attacks, we have a DOS mitigation guide, which I want to highlight for the general public, uh, which is a lot of good notes on how to architect your application to be uh, resilient against DOS attacks. And for Go libp2p, we even have integration with uh, fail to ban. So you can hook things up to automatically ban uh, malicious actors. Jenny, not Juju, now talking from like the Andreas Docs team. Uh, everyone is talking about how big, like how fast the team is growing. Our team has grown like five times bigger uh, than last year. Last year we have one person, Johnny, <laughs> to serve the whole Andreas Docs need, but now we have four full-time engineers and one part-time uh, documentation engineers, tech writers to enable, okay, I'm not gonna try to say this, but Diaz and Docs as a service. Uh, we, have, we are rebooting the team uh, in August. Uh, we have realigned our mission. We want to, uh, we want to create user, like end user documentation to make it easy for like three years, oh, not three years old, our like protocol is so complicated. Let's say seven, easy enough for seven years old to understand, you know, to, and developer using building on top of the stack uh, we're building. So again, even though we have been growing faster, but the engineers just like keep working fast and shipping new features, so we are still not a big enough team. Uh, that's why we can only focus on three projects right now, uh, being Filecoin, IPFS, and libp 2 p I know there are some IPL friends here who want some support, but like, you know, if I get more people, we will try to make that happen. Um, but the idea is for each uh, docs engineer, and they are embedded within the engineering project team, uh, along with the future releases, uh, major, um, product launch, we will have the end user documentation ready uh, so that people can actually use um, the amazing features that everyone just described like, earlier. Uh, so uh, we are joined by, we are, we are in collaboration relation uh, with a lot of other teams uh, from like AutoCore DevRoute team, FVM DX team. So we will be shipping some like FVM docs to, um, like this year, uh, MetaMask integration just works. I hope we have some like user documentation for smart contract developers started to integrate things in. Uh, we are also working with the Lotus TS team uh, for people to understand how to run a node and how to join Filecoin and like, you know, uh, store and retrieve data. IPFS live with PvP, honestly, my team member knows it better than I do, so like, please go find like Danny, James, Johnny, and Timo and to ask them like, what's gonna be going into the new docs uh, later on. And we are also trying to enable the us, like the docs as a service, so we are doc documenting the documentations. Uh, so we are, basically you can find a series of the guides in our uh, Notion pages. Uh, if you follow the guides, you should be able to spin up a doc site for your own project if you want to, you don't have to blocked by our limited resources. Uh, so go check it out. We also have deployed something like Molly really likes, like <laughs> matrix analysis to a lot of the major documentation sites. And uh, the whole idea is like, we want to know, uh, are people trying, uh, are people finding the uh, content they are trying to learn, like the, the material they are trying to learn from our documentation? If not, we're gonna try to improve that. So all the matrix is actually in all the sit reps of each project. So if you are curious about if people are reading our tech or not, go check the matrix out. Uh, but I think that's that. Awesome, so that is our Endres 2022 summary of all of the amazing impact across all of these teams. I think this deserves a huge minion level round of applause. <laughs>